Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome April Underwood, Slack's Chief Product Officer, to the stage. Thank you so much for being here. We are so excited to see all of you at a packed house. Um, we're expecting a, a really great day ahead and, and we appreciate you all being here. Um, many of you probably know this, but this is our first ever developer conference. So thanks for being a part of it. So who are you? Um, here in the audience today, we are joined by developers on our platform, customers as well as partners. And we all have something in common, which is that we're all building together a better way of working for millions of people. And we actually shared recently that that's eight million daily active users working on Slack. Three million of those users are paid, and those are across 70,000 of our paid teams, but they actually only represent a fraction of the 500,000 organizations that are choosing to do work on Slack. The opportunity is really massive and we're so humbled by this adoption and by all of you coming here to join us in building for this future. So our mission here at Slack is to make people's working lives simpler, more pleasant, and more productive. And with our platform and with our community of developers, including many of you, that vision and that mission really becomes a reality. So, those of you who have been with us for a little while may remember that we launched the Slack platform in December of 2015. And I cannot tell you how excited we were at that point that we had 150 apps in the app directory. But here we are today and we have over 1,500. And it's just that, I mean, that's just phenomenal, a 10x growth in just such a short amount of time. And we have 200,000 weekly active developers, 200,000 people building every week on top of the Slack platform for such a wide variety of purposes from very custom needs within specific organizations all the way to building applications that are, that are in the app directory that can be used by these 8 million daily active users. So in the audience today, two thirds of you have told us that you are building internal integrations. You're building on top of our platform to build the tools and the, the capabilities and the notifications that your own team needs that nobody else would really need. They're, they're tailor fit to exactly your business's needs and your culture. And then one third of you are building applications that are available in the Slack app directory. And what's even more fascinating is that there's a lot of overlap between those two groups. So many of you are building applications for the 8 million users on top of Slack, and you're launching those in the app directory, but you're finding along the way that there are all sorts of tailored ways that you can use our platform for your own company's needs as well. So I want to talk about a few of those, of those partners that are building here. So one of them is Guru which is a knowledge management solution. Are the guru, guru folks here? I know at least some of you are. Um, so they launched um, as one of our Slack fund partners back in 2016. So they were a new application going after the knowledge management solution play, space, and they launched on top of the platform, when it put their app into the Slack app directory, and since that time, they've seen adoption by just in a really impressive customer list. So folks like Spotify and Ikea, these customers discovered and found value in using, in using Guru because they saw that opportunity for it to work well with Slack. And building on Slack has been uh, you know, really such a vehicle for Guru's growth based on what we've been hearing from the team, and this is exactly what we like to hear. It's so gratifying to us to help bring developers, small teams that are building new solutions to a wide audience of customers through the Slack app directory. Quartz is a popular news, dig, digital news outlet for people in the new global economy. And they have this fast-paced newsroom, and they use Slack for all sorts of different purposes, from critical newsroom activities to some pretty simple and um, but uh, also very important ways that they run their office. So the Quartz app pushes out a lot of mobile notifications, and you know, it's really important to them to get them right. So they've taken advantage of Slack to build a bot, the Quartz bot, that pushes a notification to a channel where one more person can put their eyes on it before it goes out. And these are the types of simple workflows that Slack is great for. 
Simple, quick tasks that benefit by bringing the work to where people already are. Because the Slack customers are connected to Slack for over 10 hours a day and actively using it for two hours and 20 minutes a day. So it just makes sense that these types of workflows that would otherwise, otherwise be a big interruption of one's workday can come to Slack, can be resolved easily by the people who have the context and the ability to get the work done. But Quartz has taken it a few steps further. So in the New York City office, at times, people leave their key fobs at their desk. So rather than leaving people stranded outside or having to find ways to track down other employees to open the door for them, they just integrated Slack with an IoT doorbell and let the entire office know when the doorbell was ringing so that they'd have the ability for an entire channel of people to, to keep their eyes on it. And um, it would be pretty obvious if somebody was getting left out in the cold. But at times, it's also been very hot in this office. Their air conditioning broke during a hot New York summer. And so they built a simple integration to their thermostat so that employees could, from home, make the decision as to whether to come into the office today or whether to work from home. And they had a little fun while doing it. So indeed, I would not want to work in a 76 degree office. So this seems like a pretty useful and tiny little integration that, uh, that makes Quartz more efficient. Finally, let's talk about one of our larger partners who probably many of you use, Dropbox, recently went public. Um, and they have, uh, you know, over 500, uh, they have over 500 million users. And what Dropbox has found is that teams which use the Slack app are 40% more active, and they actually are retained at higher rates than teams that don't use Dropbox with Slack. And this is something we consistently hear from even some of the largest partners with, with whom we work, that when customers use Slack along with those applications, they get more value from both of them. So um, I know it's a little uh, you know, campy to say, but there really is a lot of win-win in, um, in building on top of our platform. And ultimately, our customers, our shared customers benefit. So we have so much for you today. Um, you're going to hear from Brian Elliott, our relatively new general manager of platform. He joined us about five months ago, and he's going to be sharing some really exciting new product announcements that we have today. You'll also hear from Brad Armstrong, our Vice President of Partnerships, about some of our latest partnerships and our Slack fund. And then finally, you'll hear from Bear Douglas, uh, our, our Head of Developer Relations, and she's going to talk about some developer tools and our community. And beyond that, we have just a great lineup today. The team has worked really hard and is so excited to have you all here. So it's my pleasure to get off the stage and welcome Brian Elliott. Thanks, April. Good morning. I'm Brian Elliott, General Manager of Platform here at Slack. I am super excited to be here with you today at SPEC, our first ever developer conference. I'm going to be sharing with you some of what's our roadmap, on our roadmap the foundations, the specs for what we're going to build for years to come to help you create better tools for your teams and your customers. Slack is a collaboration hub. We bring together people, information, and the tools they need to make their working lives simpler, more pleasant, and more productive. The platform itself is the basis on which you all work with us to make that collaboration work, bringing all of the best in breed tools that you create together. Enterprise software is changing. User-centric design is allowing people to pick their own favorite tools to use at work. In the words of one of our customers, I've got the Jetsons on my smartphone, why do I have to use the Flintstones tools at work? Those best of breed solutions, though, create gaps, seams that information falls through that make work harder at times for people. You've all had this experience every day. You get a notification in email, you click the link, the website opens, you, uh, you authenticate in for the umpteenth time, you find the right tab, you click the link, you find the right spot, you approve the expense report, you click back out. Doing that takes you five to 10 minutes. Doing it eight to 10 times a day, five days a week, all year long really adds up. The information also sat in two different systems. Slack's platform is how we actually bring that back together. It's the investment that we've made together in interoperability across our capabilities that really makes people's working lives better. And that's showing on a continuing basis in our growth. As April mentioned, we have over 1,500 apps in our directory and over 200,000 weekly active developers on Slack. But it's not just the products you're creating, it's the fact that they actually drive usage. 94% of paid teams on Slack use apps and integrations. And in fact, 65% of paid teams have built internal integrations. 
custom workflows and apps for their teams that enable them to get work done internally. Over 15,000 of these internal integrations are launched every week on Slack. That's great growth, but we can do more. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about three things that we're working on that will help people get work done more effectively. Number one, how do you close the loop across apps? We've, br help, we've helped you bring work into Slack. How do we make sure that you can bring work back out of Slack as well? Number two, how do you deploy apps and integrations across entire organizations seamlessly? And number three, how do we provide you, our developer community, with the building blocks you need to create rich interactions for users? Let's start with the first one, closing the loop across apps. I am super excited. We have just launched Actions. This is live now, and I'll talk through some of the partnerships that are launching on it. Actions are actually two, and you can hear, by the way, there's a small crowd back in the room that's cheering. <laughs> there are two really big things here going on. One is interoperability, making apps work seamlessly together, bringing work in and out of Slack, and closing the loop across best-of-breed software solutions. The second, equally important, is usability, driving discovery of apps, bringing apps for the first time, your icons and descriptions directly into the message pane. If you think about what we en enable today, most work is actually bringing work into Slack. Using notifications, message buttons, the events API, it's allowing people to do work inside of Slack. This is actually my favorite example. This is actually the Concur Expense Beta app. I disguised Liza's name, Liza's here today. Um, but this is an expense report that I got. I can click the Approve button and I'm done. I can click Send Back, or I can click More Info and go off into Concur if I need to do something more complicated. That's great, but how do I close the loop? How do I actually allow me to take action on a message on the content that sits inside of Slack quickly and easily to bring it back into other applications? Let me give you an example. Let's talk through what Asana has built and deployed this morning. Asana provides project management tools for teams. Tara and Rob are working on the Q2 launch project. Tara says, can we review this next week? Rob says, I'll set that up now. Rob clicks on the message, opens the actions drawer, finds the create a task message from Asana. The series here is really easy, right? You've got a set of logos and quick, easy to comprehend descriptions from a user for a user to, to take action on. Clicks on the task, gets a dialog box from Asana where he can assign it to a person, assign a date, due date to it, associate it with a project, and pull in the content that was already there from Terra. Can we review this next week? Click create, and you get a success mes message back in Slack. Equally important. All this content now exists in Asana as well. The tasks that he created, the content he created, and most importantly, a link back to the specific message in the channel where it was created. I don't know about you, but I have this happen all the time where I kind of forget the context where something happened, you go and look at it a month later. This allows you to maintain that context and information across your applications. So app discovery on every Met Slack message is a big deal in this. This is a, the first time that we've actually done this. It's also a way to drive usability across a wide range of users because you don't have to use a slash command to do this. What would be great is if we actually did a demo for you. So let's do a demo. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Pranay Agrawal, the lead developer on Actions. Come on up, Pranay. Hey, Pranay. It's been an exciting morning. Team's been pretty busy. Yep. Uh, Pranay's gonna. <laughs> Small amount of panic in Pranay's voice. Uh, but I heard the cheers in the back, so I know we're feeling good about it. Um, Pranay's gonna pull up a, a, a Slack instance here. Think of this as you've got a team that's actually working on the beta development of a product. Let's call it Project Nano. Project Nano's in beta. The team's been testing it for a little while. They're getting ready for the launch. As usually happens, you've got a multidisciplinary team that's working on this in Slack to pull it off. Product design, engineering, sales, marketing, and importantly, customer support. So Jennifer from customer support gets a ticket from a beta customer that says, I'm getting a redirect on the settings page. She shares that in this in channel in Project Nano. Zendesk has a nice little unfurl, so it actually shows the information and content. Nobody has to click it to read it. Um, but they actually get the content and information. So Pranay, what can we do with this? I'm glad you asked, Brian. As you can see here, Steve, the product manager, knows that there's already a JIRA issue for this ticket. Just by mentioning the issue number, he triggers another unfurl from the JIRA app, which provides useful context for Jennifer and the supporting team in this channel. What would be even better is if this context showed up in Zendesk itself. Now we get to use our new feature, Actions. I can highlight this message and bring up a menu containing 
all of the actions that you may already be familiar with, like marking the messages in red, creating a reminder, or deleting the message. Right below them, we've added a new section dedicated solely to apps. Your most used actions show up right here, and the rest of them are one click away. You can see relevant actions from all of the apps installed on your team. And of course, you can add your own. In order to keep this launch on track, I want to make sure that the beta customer gets the support that they need. This one is a known issue. So I'm going to use an action provided by Zendesk to add Steve's message, which is displayed above, as a note to the existing ticket. I click on the action, which brings up a dialog. You can see that the message text is already filled in. I can edit it if needed. Otherwise, I can just enter a ticket number and hit Submit. Zendesk immediately posts a reply right here in channel, telling me that the work I need is done. They have also linked to the ticket right here, so now I can click and hop right into Zendesk. Let me show you what this looks like in Zendesk. As you can see, the ticket just updated live and posted the message that I shared right here. So now any customer support agent that comes across it has all of the context that they need. That's awesome. Not only do you actually have the content there, it actually shows who posted it, it shows it came from Slack, and you've got a link back to the actual message in the channel too. So you can bi-directionally link back and forth. What else can we do to fix this problem here, Pranay? Great question, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, there's more. As an engineer, I know the importance of staying on top of tickets filed by beta customers. What would be great is to make sure that this Zendesk ticket is linked back to the issue in Jira so that the team is aware that more customers are running into this bug. You probably achieved this today by opening many different browser tabs and copying and pasting bits of content between them. Let me show you how, can, how you can do this in just a couple of clicks right from the Slack channel. Let's switch back to the channel. And over here, I can see that Zendesk has posted a new message containing the updated details of this ticket. Now I'm going to use another action, this one provided by the Jira app, to link this message to the existing JIRA issue. I bring up the same menu, and this time click Attach to Issue. The app posts a message asking me to select the relevant issue. I can do that from right here. Then it asks me for confirmation. I click on it, and just like that, it tells me that my work is done. Way to go. Awesome. Thank you, Pranay. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Like these are simple shortcuts and affordances for users, but this is a big deal. What you've got, and you all do this every day, you've got teams that use different tools. Your customer support team might use Zendesk, your engineering team might use Jira, and what Pranay just did is he integrated Zendesk and Jira with Slack. He did something else too. He just actually integrated Jira to Zendesk because he actually took the Zendesk ticket, pulled it into the Jira issue, so those two are linked together as well. So as developers, when you use Actions, you're not only integrating into Slack, you're actually making integrations across the entire ecosystem work. That's pretty awesome. We're doing this with a large number of partners. Bitbucket for repos and pull requests. Alice can actually click on the message content, attach it to a pull request, assign it to a specific repo, and a pull request. and I get a success message back, which is great. There are teams that do this more broadly. Sales and marketing need support as well. Our friends at HubSpot have actually integrated actions into their CRM. So Russell and Keeley are actually working on Tea Time, an account. Russell says, let's work on that QBR for Tea Time next week. Keeley says, thumbs up. We're ready to go. She opens up the dialog box, clicks add a task from HubSpot, gets a dialog between the two, can assign not only her name and who, this, who it's assigned to, but can actually associate this with an account, a contact name, or a deal, clicks create, and gets the success message. This is live. We now have nine partners up and doing this coming up, coming up today, a wide range of partners, people doing customer support tools with Zendesk, sales and marketing support with HubSpot, project management with Asana, products from our Atlassian friends, Jira and Bitbucket, Teamline, Pocket, Todo, and Guru. Again, simple shortcuts that, that help, help users use Slack to get action done and close the loop from an interoperability standpoint. We're ready for you to build on this starting this morning. The rollout is currently underway. 
please come and join Tomomi and Murray right here at 1040 AM where she'll talk through simple shortcuts, blueprints about exactly how this works. So actions help you close the loop across apps. We also need to help you deploy across organizations. Workspace apps. Workspace apps, the Workspace token and permissions API has been in preview for a few months now. And in fact, we've had some developers building on it. Brandon Keepers from GitHub will be up here talking about, about this later today. The Workspace token allows teams to build apps and deploy them at the Workspace level instead of the user level. The permissions API allows you to progressively un uh, unfurl functionality and add it to your app without making the user reinstall your app. Both of those are great from a developer perspective and importantly from a user and admin perspective because it allows them to have more dependability and greater control over their apps and app usage. At the same time, last year Slack launched Enterprise Grid. This is our tool for large scale organizations that have dozens and hundreds of workspaces. Slack's seen tremendous growth from an enterprise perspective. Overall, 65% of the Fortune 100 are paid customers of Slack. Bringing this together, the, work, the Enterprise Grid product allows different workspaces, business units, divisions, and organizations to live inside a single organization. So that you've got single sign-on, administrative controls, and access to all of your teams and content, while now not forcing everyone into one instance. Workspace apps need to mirror the same capability. We need to allow you to install not only at the workspace level, but organization-wide. Here's an example. Control from an admin perspective means that your team, if you're the admin at Comcast or IBM, might use Sentry for error tracking. You're probably going to want to install Sentry on a set of specific instances that it makes sense, IT and engineering. On the other hand, maybe you've actually decided that Google Drive is actually going to be your default file storage. And if so, as an organization admin in Slack, you want to be, to be able to deploy Google Drive everywhere, all workspaces, all channels, all users. That's a big deal if you've got hundreds or even thousands of workspaces, which some of our customers do. It's also important if you happen to be an internal app developer. So if you built the IT Help Desk app, you really want to build it once and have it deployed everywhere, making it available to every employee in your company, no matter where they are and where they go. Workspace apps will actually be up here on stage. Bert Feng, who's one of our lead developers, will be here along with Brandon Keepers from GitHub talking about what Bert's building from an org level deploy perspective and what Brandon has actually been working on in terms of the actual GitHub experience. We're targeting this for general availability in the fall, along with the ability for people to have programmatic tools for converting user token apps to workspace token apps. Actions, close the loop across apps. Workspace apps helps you deploy across organizations. What about rich interactions? Today, we're previewing BlockKit. BlockKit is our new UI foundation. It's a set of tools to help you build richer interactions with customers. It's also providing developers with greater flexibility in terms of how they display those blocks and content. And it's about providing a consistent user experience across things like attachments and dialogues. Today, all apps are forced into a limited set of ways to display rich information. If you've looked at and seen and used all the different apps that are in Slack, many of them end up with the same layout regardless of what functionality they're trying to deploy. When in reality, what you need is a set of components that let you build rich interactive displays that are easier for people to comprehend, digest, and act on. BlockKit, the version one of which I'll talk through today, is a set of basic and interactive elements that together allow you to control user experience and make for richer experiences inside of Slack. Let's flip through a few of these. The text block, it's basic plain text or Slack markdown. A text collection, this is a horizontal stacking of two text blocks. An image, including a caption. An inline image, a text description with a right aligned thumbnail. A context collection, think of this as meta information about the content. It's a text and a small image stacked in line where you have control over the order and number of elements that you place. It's that little bit right down there where it says test passed. We're also continuing to support the color bar because the color bar, the color block, actually can uh, do some similar functionality. The divider. This is my personal favorite. It's a divider. <laughs> Think about it, though. This is, the, this is a simple separator that allows you to display content and information to users that makes it much more digestible for them and easier for them to comprehend. Interactive collection. This is a group of buttons, selects, and overflow menus that you place together in line in any order that you want. 
in the line select, which is a text description right with a right align select element, and two last bits, an inline overflow, that nested set of, of additional options for users, and a date picker, um, another personal favorite, and one that I know a number of you have been asking for for a long time. Besides these blocks themselves, the other thing that this provides is flexibility in, in terms of vertical control. You decide how you want to stack components, how you want to place them on the page, and what order makes the most sense for your app and for your user base. This looks really good. If we're going to release this, we're going to need a builder that goes along with it. And in fact, it'd be great if that builder had WYSIWYG capabilities and maybe did some prototyping. Uh, in fact, we actually have such a thing. So please join me in welcoming Jamie Mounts, lead front-end developer for the Block Kit Builder, to the stage. Thanks, Jamie, for coming up and doing this. Thank you, Brian. Jamie's been Jamie and the team have been working on this for a while. It's pretty cool. All right. I'd love to show you how the Block Kit Builder can help us turn these canoe app designs into code. Introducing the Builder. All the V1 blocks are available along the left-hand side, like the text block, the image block, and Brian's personal favorite, the divider. Clicking them adds them to a central preview area to see how it'll appear in the Slack client. You can also remove the blocks here. On the right hand, you'll see the JSON that you need to describe this UI automatically generated based on some sample content. You don't even need to leave the builder to understand how to read and write the JSON. You can open information and see the block's name, description, and the key value pairs that the API will expect. There's also a couple Slack designer approved examples of how to use the blocks. Let's get started making our canoe app. It looks to me like an inline image block here describes the hotel, and a context collection block shows its location. We can select those two blocks from the tray to see how they'll look. Inline image and context collection. And look at that. It even has very similar copy to what I need. <laughs> Next, we need a button. I'm going to use the interactive collection block. We will have to customize this block. It has a couple too many buttons. Let's edit it to just have one main call to action. <coughs> with some improved text. And an action ID that describes the content. This is looking great. Let's do a quick sanity check to see how it'll look on mobile web. Nothing is broken. Awesome. Over here, I have a Slack channel with my designer. I want their feedback and approval on what I've built. I can use the Send to Slack button to send it into a channel. All the way down here. There it is. This is a really easy way for me to get quick feedback on my app prototype from my team, from inside my real Slack workspace. This is all looking great. Over here, I have a quick app that I've built using the Node SDK. My Magic API needs the user ID and their hotel selection to reserve their room. When a user interacts with my app's button in Slack, my app will receive an action payload with all the information about that action. It's now easier than ever to understand the structure of that payload. We can click on this button and see an example payload that we can examine right here in the builder. I see the user object has the ID, and the action ID is what they clicked. We're all done. I'm just going to copy this JSON and send it to my users using the chat.postmessage API and our new blocks key inside of our attachment array. And just like that, I've built my first attachment using BlockKit. Woohoo! <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. That was amazing. Uh, Jamie and the team are great. They're actually going to be in the studio space uh, uh, after this and all day long showing the builder and what's going on there. V1 blocks are intentional. We're going for simple, basic tools that you can use to build quick contextual work inside of Slack. 
We will continue to build on top of this for years to come, and I'll get into that in a second. The intent here is to make it easier for people to do work inside of Slack without overlo overload overloading or overwhelming them. We're also gonna continue to take this further. Consistency matters. Besides the attachments array, which will be part of V1, we'll bring this to um, dialogues next, and we'll continue to build on top of it. We want your thoughts and opinions on this. V2 might include things like an image carousel, checkboxes, radio buttons, a table, and maybe something like a face pile. You give us user IDs, we pull in the avatars, people can click on them to see the Slack profile of the particular user. The studio demo space will actually have this going for most of the day today. Uh, Jamie will be there to talk about the builder, along with the rest of the engineering team, product managers, designers, show you more detail of what's in V1, and get your thoughts and opinions on V2, because we want to know what all you want, what your priorities are, and how we can make this better. So actions, actions closed the loop across apps and also gave all of you greater discoverability and users greater utility inside of applications and right on the message pane. Workspace apps is how you'll deploy across entire organizations, giving developers better tools, administrators easier ability to deploy across an entire company. And BlockKit is our next generation foundation for building rich interactive user experiences inside of Slack. Workspace apps and BlockKit are foundations that we will be building on for years to come. This is only part of our roadmap. The rest of it's over in the studio space. There's a lot, of, lot more uh, to be said and done on this, but we want your feedback and opinion. Please come and talk with our team over the course of the rest of the day today. Because as a collaboration hub, it's you, our partners, our developers, and our customers that are the key part of hep helping people get work done. And it's that partnership that's most critical. Here to talk more about the state of that partnership is our VP of uh, Partnerships, Brad Armstrong. Hey, Brad. Thank you, Brian. You bet. It's so great to be here today at our first developer conference, and I want to give a special shout out to all of you who were with us two years ago when we launched the platform. So I run partnerships here at Slack. We work with everyone from the largest enterprise software providers in the world to best of breed SaaS companies to early stage startups. Our partners also span the entire range of enterprise software categories from sales tools to customer success to dev tools and analytics. They're all partnering with us because they understand the power of our collaboration hub. Now at Slack, partnering isn't just something that we do, it's a fundamental part of who we are. Over the last couple of years, we've embedded partners into everything we do as a company, from building products to going to market to the tools we choose to, use our, to get our own jobs done. Partners are critical to all of it. Today, we're going to focus on the early stage side of our ecosystem, entrepreneurs and developers just like many of you who are building their companies on Slack. When we launched the platform two years ago, we also, we also launched the Slack Fund. Our mission is to foster the best companies building the future of work with Slack as a fundamental paradigm interface. We've been totally blown away by the innovation and momentum we've been seeing from these companies. Today, we're incredibly excited to announce six new Slack fund investments. Aptly, Clara Labs, LearnMetrics, Xylo, Epistema, and Pull Request. What's so notable about these companies is the range of use cases they're pursuing with the platform, from real estate property management to code review as a service to SaaS spend optimization. Uh, they're really pushing the limits of the platform, and we're incredibly excited to be working with them. So since we launched the Slack Fund, we've been incredibly busy as both partners and also as investors. We've made 38 investments to date in these great companies. Not only are they building the future of work, they're also building great businesses. These are the next great SaaS companies, and that's really borne out in the reception we've seen from the investing community and the amount of capital that's come into these companies. So across those 38 investments, we've seen $200 million in venture capital into these companies, and 11 of our companies have gone on to raise subsequent rounds. They're showing momentum in their businesses, and venture capitalists are taking note. And it's happening because the best VCs in the Valley see the same momentum and innovation that we're all seeing right here today. It's happening on this platform. It's happening on Slack. Let's take a closer look at a couple of these companies. So Loom allows you to record and share quick videos uh, for work. 
It's a really great way to get the richness of video communication and put it right in Slack where you're already working. Loom has an enviable customer list and they already have 600,000 users. Great momentum there. Troops. Troops is bringing Salesforce automation right into Slack. So sales is an inherently collaborative process and sales teams are getting a ton of value in seeing their, seeing their CRM workflows come right into Slack. They have great momentum, an enviable customer list, um, and over a thousand teams using them already. So best of luck to Troops. Donut, it's all about building customer company culture. Whether you're onboarding new employees, uh, whether you're making connections between existing employees within a company, Donut helps you get there because people know that company culture is a major competitive differentiator. Donut has made, as you see here, 500,000 connections between employees within their customers. And I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a customer list that anybody would be proud of. So the success we see today with Loom and Troops and Donut uh, is something that's unique in this industry. Companies at this stage of their life cycles bringing in customers of this caliber and seeing this kind of traction. But it's really only a fraction of what's happening within the Slack partner ecosystem overall, and you're gonna see a lot more about that today. So finally, I wanna thank all of you, our partners, our developers, our customers, for making this all possible. It's because of your partnership with us that the Collaboration Hub is a reality, uh, and we thank you very much, so thank you for being here. With that, I'm gonna welcome Bear Douglas on stage, who is our head of global developer relations, to talk about the global developer community and everything that's happening within that group. Thank you very much. Hello again, everybody. We are so excited that you are here with us today. There are hundreds of you in the room today and hundreds more tuning in on the live stream for this, our first developer conference. And it's not lost on us that those of you who have made the effort to be here in the room today have come to San Francisco to meet us. Our global community is that truly global. With over 200,000 developers developing every single week on Slack's platform, eight out of 10 of the top cities by developer population are actually outside the US. And we've seen tremendous growth over the last year in cities in Europe, in Asia, in South America, and in Australia. So over the last year, the developer relations team has gone on the road to meet you where you are. We went on tours in Europe and in Asia, and we want to hear about the challenges you're facing and the kinds of apps you're building. One of the things we learned on the road while we were in Europe was that people needed a better way to test their apps, and that led us to releasing our testing tool, Steno. So we learn so much from you when we come and talk to you in person that we know it's time to go on the road again. So starting in June, we'll be going on a tour in APAC, visiting seven cities in Asia and in Australia. We'll be coming back to Europe in the fall as well, with dates in November announcing a little bit closer to that. So stay tuned over the next coming months. Now, we know that there are developers around the world in places that we can't get to on a single roadshow. We see you online answering questions that people have. We see you giving talks and helping people learn from what you know. And that kind of community support is critical to everyone's success on the platform. So today, for the first time, we're rolling out a program to help you create Slack platform community meetups in your own hometown with our support. We'll be helping you with content, with guidance, and through our collaboration with meetup.com, uh, space, free space, potentially, to host your event at a WeWork around the globe. So if you're interested in hosting one of these in your own hometown, check out the link on meetup.com and fill out our application form. We'd be really excited to work with you. Now, if you're not ready to host your own meetup, but you're still interested in learning more about the Slack platform live and in person, we'll be partnering with Major League Hacking's global student network to provide trainings around the world about how to build on Slack. If you're interested in hosting one of these, you can check it out on mlh.io and register your interest. These will be launching in the fall of 2018, and we couldn't be more excited to kick them off. Now, wherever you are in the world, we're here to help you get the tools that you need to build ambitious apps. So here's what you might have missed over the last few months in our tooling updates. We have substantial updates to both our first-party SDKs for Node and Python, including TypeScript support in their Node SDK, and enhanced support for the Events API inside Python. We've also released updates to Steno, our testing tool, including automatic token redaction, so you can create tests and re make recordings without worrying that you're leaking any sensitive information. Next up, we're going to be releasing file-based configuration, so you can kick Steno off with all of the configuration you need directly from a file. About uh, six months ago, we also released a spec according to the OpenAPI 2.0 spec describing our web API. 
Today, for the first time, we are releasing a new async API spec that describes our events API. And coming soon, we're going to be releasing a schema for the web API that conforms to the OpenAPI 3.0 spec. We're really excited to see what you can build on top of those specs, creating even better tools for developers. But we have something brand new for you today to check out as well. We've heard from all of you that you need a better way to build on Slack and test things out. And so today, I'm excited to welcome Colm Doyle to the stage. He's our developer relations lead in EMEA to show you what we've got for you in Slack developer tools. Welcome, Colm. Thanks, Bear. Uh, so when I go out and meet with Slack developers, we talk a lot about where Slack is where work happens. But as developers of Slack applications, there's not a lot of workflows that allow you to learn about your application, test it, and inspect how other applications work. So we've built Slack developer tools to help you with that. So I've already installed this uh, SDT on my development workspace here. So I'm going to see what I can do by calling SDT help. OK, so I have a bunch of options here. So I'm going to start with something pretty simple. I'm going to call api.test. So if I just do sdt call api.test, sdt is going to make a call to the Slack API. And you'll see here it's provided the response from the API as well as the original request that went out. But let's do something a bit more complex. Let's post a message into this channel. So if I do slash sdt call chat.post and do the call. OK, so something's gone wrong here. I've used the wrong method name. But SDT has actually captured that for me and has looked at the method name that I gave and tried to divine what message I was trying to call in the first place. So I wanted to post the message into the channel. So I'm going to pick chat.postmessage. And what SDT is going to do here is it's going to replay that call. And it's going to take along all the original parameters, but pass them to the correct method name. So I will just click yes here. OK, but it's gone wrong again. Clearly, I need to read the documentation. So previously, what I would have done now is I would have swapped out to a browser window, gone to api.slack.com, and searched through our documentation. But SDT, combined with the open API that Bear just mentioned, allows me to do this right here in the channel. So if I just do slash SDT docs chat dot post message, and what SDT is going to do here is it's going to give me all of the parameters that I need to call that API method, as well as details of the scopes. So obviously, I was missing more than one uh, parameter. So I'm going to try one more time. So slash SDT call chat.post message text equals oh, hello spec. Great. So that's finally worked. So as you can see here, what SDT has done is it has posted into the message. And as with the other API calls, it's given details of the response as well as the arguments that were passed along. So you can see text hello spec here. Now, that's a pretty simple message. It's not particularly hard to divine how I did that. But if I swap over to this other channel here, you'll see there's a message here that uses some more of our uh, more advanced UI components, like message menus and buttons. And I'm sure as developers, we've all browsed the web, and we've seen UI and UX patterns that we really like, and we're curious as to how the developer has built those. And we've always been able to answer that question by just right-clicking on that element in our browser and seeing an inspect element. But up to now, there's never really been a way to do that for a Slack message. So using the Actions feature that we've just announced, I can just go over here to the right, click, and we now have an Inspect Message action right there in the menu. So if we click this, what Slack Developer Tools has done is it's given us all of the JSON required to build that message. So we can instantly see how it's done. And this will be updated to support BlockKit as well. <laughs> now. This is a lot of JSON to copy and paste. And what if we want to see what it looks like slightly differently? Well, we've got you solved there as well. Right down here at the bottom, there's a button open in Message Builder. When you click this, it brings you over to api.slack.com and pre-fills uh, pre -fills the box with all of the uh, elements required to produce that message. So I can just simply go here, make a slight edit, and Message Builder is automatically updating. So we can see exactly how this would look in our own application. And that's just some of the features of Slack developer tools. Thank you so much, Colm. Another round of applause.
We're really excited to release Slack developer tools to you. It's designed for use inside development workspaces only. So stay tuned in the next couple of days for the release and guidance on how best to use it. So you can get started today with a lot of the things that we've been talking about. You can register your interest for hosting a Slack platform community meetup, for hosting a workshop with MLH, and you can check out our whole suite of offering at api.slack.com slash tools. And if you're interested in a walkthrough live today, Ankar Oberoi, our tech lead for DevTools, is going to be walking you through end-to-end -end how to build an app using all of Slack's first-party tools, including SDT. So come check that out this afternoon. We've got a packed agenda for you today. So we've just made it through the opening keynote. We're about to release you out to the morning breakouts for the day. We've separated into two tracks, the plan track and the build track. Build is where we'll get down to brass tacks of actually building things at a code level. That's going to be in this room, and we'll cover everything from how to actually use actions to details of our developer tools and launching your first app on AWS. In the build track, you'll hear more of the concepts around ways people have built custom applications in the wild, how to build workflows with less code, and more. So pick both of those from each of those tracks, and we hope to see you in each of them. But that's not all. There's active time for you not just to be listening, but to be doing and meeting with us. In the studio space off to the right, we have space in the morning for you to weigh in on our roadmap, for you to try out BlockKit, consult with us at the Slack office hours, or work to optimize your app for installs and distribution inside your organization. In the afternoon, we'll be switching that over into a mini hackathon station, where you can either build a simple app with an IoT button to help you announce when coffee is ready, or you can meet with uh, our friends at Workado to try building a workflow app that you can deploy today to your own workspace. We're really excited to have you here. Welcome again, and let's begin.